Hello everyone, it is Joe here from OmniPoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon and the Oceania International Championships is coming up next Friday. I'm traveling out on Monday and um, that's going to be really exciting. I'm commentating the event which is going to be very cool and I've been testing this format a lot so it's really time to see how the new team up decks are going to shake up the new format. For this uh, top 10 list I have a new feature, it's going to be um, having the community ratings of the decks going into this tournament, which should be pretty fun. Um, so look at the top left of your screen to see the rank of the deck and the number of votes that that deck received. Um, I haven't, well, in, in, the, in this top 10 list, I have um, grouped some variants. For example, Malamar variants, I will group Ultra and Psychic Malamar and talk about them all in one. Zoroark variants, I'll talk about all in one. So this ranking is going to be for individual decks, so it may sort of skew the ranking itself. Um, but do bear that in mind. I'm going to be clumping some lists together and talking about them in general. But I'll also be having deck lists for the most popular builds. So there's going to be a deck list that at least fit each one of these top 10. And sometimes a little extra one here, is, here and there as well if there are a few different variants floating around. So starting at number 10, we have one of my personal favorite decks to toy around with. It's Quagnag. I believe it gains a really huge card in Articuno from this set. It can help you protect your early game engine in the Quagsire. It can no longer be Guzmaned up as long as Articuno is in your active position. And this basically means that you can play some solitaire games against people, knowing that you can build up your energies without them being taken off the board, and you can work towards big Werelord GX attacks, which is going to be the reason why we have a favourable Loss March, a favourable uh, Zapdos and Malamar. Uh, the idea is we are trying to trade with Articuno in the early turns. Obviously, you can always knock out Lost Marchers. We can also be knocking out um, Jirachis, uh, Marshadows, Inkes, stuff like that for the Malamar and Zapdos builds. And this whole time, we're never losing energy because Articuno moves energy off itself and they can't gust up the Quagsire if we put the energy onto him. And he can always just use Washout to move it back to re-attack with your Articuno. And then we can move into a big Well or GX attack to knock out, you know, all the Malamars at once so they don't have response attackers sometimes. Um, we can knock out Zapdos and Jirachis if we've used a Volcanian uh, Prism to do 20 to the board. We knock out every Lost Marcher, obviously. And even against Bud Shrine, we can do uh, Weavals and Garbs all in one hit. So the fact that we basically just say there's no, there's no way that decks can target our energies anymore... Um, they can obviously gust up um, the Naggers and knock them out, but typically you just charge up and move the energy off the Naggers onto your Articuno, and then the Articuno puts the energy back onto water stuff that they can't target. So provided you can stream Articuno in the early game, you're basically just playing solitaire against these decks, and they have no real way to interact with your board until you just get the Whale down and win. Against Pikachu Zekrom, I am playing Onix, and the idea is to try and spam Onix. Obviously, their early pressure can be a little bit awkward. I think the only real loss condition for going against Lost March and Picarom is if they let loose you and you just get nothing. This is a double stage one deck, so it can be a little clunky. Simeon Coco is close. Uh, we're going to try and do the same thing. Articuno pressure, move towards Werelord for win. It's just whether the Simeon Coco can get so far ahead of you because they have Electro Powers that can hit your Articuno for weakness and they can be taking knockouts. And if they can do six flying flips essentially before you are able to get your Werelord to use his GX attack, we could lose because our uh, Quags can be knocked out and we could uh, be in trouble. So it is a bit of a race against the clock, so that is an awkward matchup at times. Um, for unfavorables, Zorak variants are awkward. They can use Muck to shut down Articuno, or they can use Lycanroc to get around its ability, and they can then be targeting your engine as ever. I don't think it's an auto-loss because we, again, are playing the um, Onyx, but... It's going to be pretty difficult for us, especially if they're shutting down some early game draw that we can have from the likes of Oranguru. Jolchon Greninja can hit your Articunos for weakness very, very easily. And they can also snipe around your board and take early prizes on your low hit point things, which is going to be, again, pretty awkward for you. And uh, for very unfavorable, Celebi Venusaur is awful. Uh, even all the attackers I have on the list, I haven't found a good, efficient one for Celebi Venusaur yet. And... Um, that's just really awkward for you. Also, they're constantly spamming the... Um, well, in the early turns, they can spam their sort of confusion poison burn attacks against your Articunos. 
And Articuno has a two retreat cost, so that's really awkward to get around. And then they just have the luxury of time to build up. So that is definitely an unfavorable matchup. Looks like the community isn't too hot on Quagnag overall. Just 11 votes, putting it at the 18th spot in the rankings. Here's my list, though. I did do a video of this uh, already, so you can see a similar build um, in action. Here, I've gone all the way up to four Articunos. I think it's such a huge card for the archetype, trying to give yourself that nice safeguard of your Quagsires. It's allowed us to go down to a 2-2 count of Quag. I think alongside two Stretcher, that's pretty safe. We're playing some tech one-off cards. The Onyx, obviously, for Picarom and Zekrom decks. Uh, Eevee Snorlax can be additional a one-hit KO uh, merchant, and he can also get us into a big hand size if he can tank hits. Magikarp Werelord can hit a nice 180 damage baseline, and also that big GX attack is going to be a huge win condition against pretty much every other non-GX deck you can come up, at it, uh, up against. So that's insane. Volcanian Prism is just a really high power level card. I think outside of just all the item cards trying to help us draw and search out Pokemon, uh, the Gladian is a nice supporter that I've included into the deck. Seeing as though we are playing um, six one-of Pokemon, these are the things we want to be pulling out. Uh, the tag teams in the right matchups. Uh, oh, sorry, seven one-of Pokemon because we have the uh, we have the Lele as well. Uh, so the one-of attackers are crucial to pull out at the right times. And... Um, yeah, that's just worth having in the deck as an extra little supporter for us as well. Because it can also just grab combo pieces when uh, our support count is relatively low anyway. We can weave this in at times. Especially when you're just playing Solitaire, doing those turns of wash out into Articuno, wash out into Articuno. You really don't need much. So you have the spare time to Gladian in the early game. So that's a pretty reasonable include that I really like. And it saves us space for adding in a two of in any single direction. It allows us to be very flexible, which is pretty cool. On to my number nine, uh, we have the New Age build of Minetric Bats. I feel like this is another archetype that's being very, very slept on. The community put it at 42nd place in the rankings, only achieving six votes. I again have done a video on this archetype. I believe this is pretty powerful, and it's really being under-respected, I think. Jolteon is one heck of a card. I think it's very, very powerful, and I think... Although it's going to be seen more often in Zapdos, it can also have its power completely highlighted and complemented by the support of uh, the Greninja pieces in the deck. Notably, the Jolteon um, Decidui archetype did receive a little bit more attention in the rankings, uh, but I believe that this is a much less clunky build and is more aggressive in the early game, which is really what we're trying to do here. Seeing as though this is somewhat similar to um, Manetric Bats, which was a previously very powerful deck in a format where we had Night March, which is essentially the same, has the same weaknesses as Lost March does now, there's going to be a home for Jolteon, in my opinion. Lost March is the thing we're definitely trying to target heavily here. I've already mentioned how it can do well against Quagnag. We are also very good at Grinching early Malamar builds and also ramping up to one-shots against their GX Pokemon if they're trying to fight us out. Zapdos variants, I believe, is close. We have... Good ways of knocking out their Zapdoses, obviously, as well as their Jirachis to try and keep up. But the counter-argument is that we are all GX-focused, so they can try and get some big bursts of damage on us that way. And we do have to be careful about Sledgehammer turns, for example, if they are going to be a Shrine Rainbow Energy build. Zarark variants, I believe, is going to be close. I think using your Swift Run GX attack is going to be clutch in the right turns. Your priority is going to be trying to dig out lots of Electro Powers and save them for big one-hit KOs when you can. But again, going first uh, against Zorak players, you can just take out early Dittos, early Rock Ruffs, early Zeruas very, very easily with this deck. It's just super, super simple doing that. Uh, going first and then on turn two, you're doing that sort of spreading attack with also your Frogadier evolutions. And it can really just ruin their board from the offset. And that's going to give you a reasonable win rate just straight away. Um, so I do think this is very reasonable. I think the the deck is also good going second because you can just get that jolty on attack off early, which is huge. I think it starts getting a bit grim when you see uh, the fact that it is a lightning deck at the end of the day, even though Swift Run can safeguard a little bit. The fact that Zoroark and uh, Pika Rom are both some powerful archetypes in the meta, people are already looking to play some fighting stuff. So Passimian Coco and Bushrine, I feel like will be very, very awkward for you. Pikachu Zekrom itself feels pretty difficult because although we have these ways of damage ramping, we do require 
you know, lots of GXs on the board the whole time, and we need the benefit of time. And Pika Rom does not allow you that time a lot of the time, a lot of uh, a lot of the games you'll be in, which is annoying. Celebi Venusaur, I think, can out tank you from what I've seen uh, of playing that matchup. Although Jolteon is doing a constant spam, and you can free retreat out of like confusion plays, and they're not necessarily one shotting you. I think it's still awkward when they have the Gardenias, the Life Forest, all these different things that are going to be the massive headache for you. Uh, so here is my list. It's slightly adapted from the video. I ended up dropping one Frogadier, one Froki to add in a Rescue Stretcher as well as a third Guzma. So some pretty standard cuts there, but I love the core of this deck still. I think it is very strong and is an archetype that's being very slept on. On to our number eight placement, Buzz Shrine based decks. Uh, I do believe this is very popular. Again, the community is starting to agree a little bit in that 12th ranking. With 20 votes, there's some belief behind this card. And I think it all lies in its favourable matchups. Having one of the best Zoroark matchups in the game, thanks to being a combination of Weavile and Buzzwall, is such a headache for the Zoro decks to get around. Pikachu and Zekrom, also in theory, very strong. They are oftentimes very item-reliant as well as ability-reliant. And you have Buzzwall on top of everything else. It's really going to keep... Pretty much the majority of their deck in check, which is awesome. Georgeon Greninja is a nice freebie to pick up if people are going to try and uh, actually back the deck, but it doesn't seem like it's one that's too popular right now. My Lost March is favorable, and I think this is one key core aspect that may have been missed from Buzz Shrine. Uh, I really like my New Age list that I'll be showing off in a second. We have ways to beat Lost March, which is very cool for us. I think close matchups include Pissimi and Coco. I think um, we can try and do early pressure with like Diancie Kakui plays or just having beast energy early with our Buzzwall. And that could be very huge for us uh, for just chaining knockouts with Sledgehammer and keeping up in the race late game with the likes of Garbodor. We again have a way to deal with their Jirachis all at one turn, similar to how we're going to try and beat Lost March. And that's also how we're going to try and keep up with the Zapdos variants. It's going to be using Rule of Evil Weavile alongside uh, Giratina using Distortion Door to knock out multiple 70 hit point things with abilities. This includes Jirachis, uh, Amolgas, um, uh, Marshadows. These are the things you're trying to capitalize on with your Weavile, which is very cool. Seeing as though you're already playing Buzzgarb Weavile, you just add one Rule of Evil to try and improve these non-GX matchups. I think it could be huge for the deck, to be honest. For the unfavorables, I think Quagnag will be very awkward for you. Although they do like to spam items, they can be attacking with their nags, they can be very non gx the whole game, and they have the early benefit of Articuno, which has nice resistance to fighting, and all they need to be doing is, is like announcing attacks for 70-70, and they can get ahead and probably stay ahead, whilst at the same time, you can't deny them any means of getting into their well or to just destroy your board. Malavar variants, I believe, is a little awkward. Again, it seems to be reliant on you trying to use your early Buzzwall pressure to take uh, the lead in terms of prizes, but usually it's going to be a pretty difficult slog to try and get through multiple Giratinas in the mid game. Celebi and Venusaur is also very, very bad for you because although our damage output can ramp fairly reasonably with both Weavile and Garb, they can shut down Garb with its big GX attack and Weavile they can completely control and it's never gonna reach enough numbers for them to be super concerned about unless they get silly with their own abilities. So here is the list. As I mentioned, the Rule of Evil is the key tech card here. Uh, I think it could really improve our win rate. Obviously, uh, trying to use Distortion Door on the same turn. The big sort of headache of this is managing your board because this deck is usually very tight on board space, requiring Mag Cargo, Oranguru, sometimes Diancie early, and then you need to have your backup of Trubbishes and Weavars flowing. But if you work towards this Distortion Door Rule of Evil play, I believe it can pay off for you uh, in that late game and really surprise people for some wins. Additionally, the Weavile has free retreat, so it's also good to just have in the deck so that when we're digging for things, we can have a free retreat pivot as well. Um, the other new inclusion really from this uh, set is the Judge's Whistle. It obviously combines nicely with Smooth Over, much more nicely in my opinion than Acrobike because you never have the headache of getting rid of key resources, most notably energy cards, was always the massive headache that you would accidentally have to discard with acro bikes here and there. Uh, and now having more access to judge can help us with the disruption aspect as well, uh, making people play more abilities and more item cards to get themselves back into a reasonable sort of hand and a reasonable board state. 
the Judge's Whistle is a great combination to have in this deck with a couple copies of Judge as well. I do think it can help out the deck a lot. So this Rule of Evil, definitely a cool tech card. I think it's very, very strong in the meta right now. Seeing as though so many people are moving towards Jirachi-based builds, we can punish it quite heavily with a Weavile if you get creative. On to number seven, Pasimian Coco. The community, again, starting to receive this with some nice hype. 46 votes now, getting up towards those higher echelons. So people are agreeing and taking note of this deck's potentially strong matchups. Lost March should be pretty free thanks to your type coverage against uh, the Jump Luffs, then Natus, and even you have um, weakness on the Emolgas as well. So everything being below 70, uh, 70 hit points or below should be pretty easy for you to just fly and flip your way through the game. Piku Zekrom, in theory, is very strong for you as well because you have your Persimians. Even if you're not really popping off, you have the benefit of time against them. They have to try and use other means of winning the game, which, you know, so many of the uh, Picaroms have gone completely combo-based and they've completely removed the likes of Acerola from their builds and it just makes the Persimian have a very strong matchup. If we saw um, some more Japanese-style lists of Picarom where we saw Max Potions and Acerolas and Aether Paradise, it would be more awkward. But it seems like from what I've seen so far from the ladder and from uh, online discussion, most people are trying to go very combo focused on Picaron. Basically combo or bust is how they're trying to play the deck at the moment. And that just makes the Persimian Coco matchup like really easy. Um, George on Greninja, another pretty nice matchup. They're very GX based and they are um, going to need to spread their board. And also Persimian can knock out Jolteons very nicely. I think Zoroark is a slightly favorable matchup. I actually think it's not very favorable, even though we are a full fighting deck. I have found it awkward at times when they are, you know, using their other attackers, even using things like Lele is just a energy drive through you with sometimes. Um, can be pretty awkward. They obviously have Acerola, Palpad, lots of stadium removals for your shrine, so the spread approach can be negated. I think the Zoroark player just has a lot of options, and they'll be keeping you honest by taking a single prize a turn. Uh, so it is still awkward for you to try and hit your energies every turn and get around judge and all that stuff. So I think it is naturally favored, but it is losable. Malamar variants, I believe, is slightly favored as well. Uh, there are awkward plays they can go for, using their Giratina to knock out their own stuff, to limit their own uh, you know, weakness against Coco flying flips. Um, and also shutting down your counter energies are the biggest things that they can try and do uh, to win the game, to really negate your output. Um, close matchups include Buzz Shrine, Zapdos variants, and Quagnag. I think you have the option um, of being able to spread in time to beat the likes of Buzz Shrine decks. They are usually reliant on getting Magcargo and Oranguru down, so their board will naturally fill up. Uh, Zapdos variants, again, they have weakness on you, and they also, their Jirachis have only 70 hit points. I found it a little closer than I was initially expecting because they are fairly efficient at being able to keep a board of just like one or two Pokemon when they need to, um, as long as they're not super concerned about um, just getting bursted by Electro Powers and, uh, you know, keep conservative and not losing to that all in one turn. Um, but I found it more awkward, especially as they can move into just a Coco GX that can take two prizes on his own back and he's probably not falling if he, they, he gets dropped late game. So I found that a closer matchup than expected. Quagnag is the race to see if the Werelord can get the GX attack off or if you can get to 120 first. The very unfavorable matchup is Celebi Venusaur. You cannot beat that matchup. I've, I find no way. I've had the um, Victini in the deck as well, the fire type Victini. It just does not do enough to beat Celebi Venusaur. So I wouldn't even tech for it. It's just an auto loss for this deck. So here is my list. Incorporating the Jirachi build does improve the consistency of this deck means we can move towards energy lottos. It means we can play some counter catches quite nicely. And also we incorporate a couple copies of Electro Power. I have been seeing a lot of builds trying to go all the way up to four. I, however, think that having three stadiums and two choice bands are still important in the deck for other reasons. So I don't see many spaces here to try and weave in more Electro Powers. Overall, a couple should be plenty to help you deal with the likes of Zapdos players. So I think that's all we really need. In general, you can just play this card down on turns to get more physical counters in play. But usually you don't want to be taking knockouts with your Coco unless you're going down that certain route of damage uh, for like a Persimian. But if you're going for a full spread route, you don't want to use Electro Power just to knock things out. You want to keep multiple Pokemon on the board so your flying flips are more effective. So I don't feel like you need the full four copies. It's too aggressive for me. I would just go for a simple build with a couple copies and keeping you nice and consistent overall. 
On to uh, my number six pick. It's going to be the Zapdos variants. 52 votes for the Jolteon base build and a lot less love for the Shrine base build of Zapdos from the community. Um, it's got a pretty nice Pikachu Zekrom matchup. That's something it can boast. Close matchups against a lot of other non-GX decks because it is able to race quite efficiently just by gusting all the time and using that Jirachi engine to gain hand advantage and um, try and get lots of Electro Powers rolling and combinations for knockouts. I also think it's got a fairly close Zoroark. I know a lot of people um, do think the Zoroark matchup is pretty awkward. Um, I am playing Zeb Striker in both my variants of Zapdos to try and improve the matchup, not only giving you Sprint as a backup engine to your Jirachi, but also um, a backup attacker as well with the new Zeb Striker that we have in the deck. I think for Unfavorables, Celebi Venusaur is still pretty awkward, even though you have um, Zero Aura GX and Coco GX in the Jolteon build. In the um, Shrine build, you can try and use Nihiligo to copy his GX attack to um, reset your own deck if you have two energies on your Nihiligo on the key turn. Uh, you pretty much need to do that sometimes to stop yourself decking out. Um, and the fact that um, a, a good amount of Venusaurs are moving away from hammers means that you might actually have enough resources to try and beat them, but I think you'll never have enough damage output because they are really healy at the moment. Quagnag, you really can't interact with for the whole game, and uh, Zapdos really likes to be using Guzma all the time it can, uh, not only because... Uh, you're going to be taking the easy prizes, but also because you get yourself out of the active position. And if they just offer you no targets, that's going to be really awkward for you. And you could just really slow down to a halt. Um, I think Jolteon Greninja is awkward. And I think Malamar variants could be awkward as well. I'm specifically thinking about Ultra Squids, which can do the um, the spreading attack with the Sky Scorching Light. That's the biggest issue I foresee for Zapdos variants against Mali builds. Uh, I think against... Uh, Psychic Mali builds it will have a much better matchup, but against Ultra, it's going to look pretty grim in my opinion. So here is the first list. This is going to be my Zapdos Jolteon list, the one that was more popular. It's just a thin Jolteon line. I think the card is very, very strong, but I think it basically hits the field and stays on the field for a few turns. It's normally efficient enough to take three prizes off his own back, and that's really good for a deck that likes to be racing early anyway. Um, I am incorporating both the Tapu Koko GX and the Zero Aura GX in this list. Um, Zero Aura gives you some nice safeguarding against other Absols. Uh, it's also giving you a nice GX attack against random mill players, against Wondrous Lab in some certain decks as well. Uh, Coco GX giving you a big burst of damage against anyone that tries to attach too many energy cards. Even Zoroark can fall into that trap sometimes and you can get big one-hit KOs. Like I said, I'm a big fan of the Zeb Striker line in the list, offering Raid as a nice attack that can be burst out of nowhere if you use your Coco Prism or Thunder Mountain on a key turn, and having that backup of Sprint, meaning you're not completely just scooping up your cards when you see a Muck hit the field, which is much more likely now from Zoroark variants as they have often moved over towards a Lily engine that's also playing Alolan Grimer. I think those are really the only key standout things. Other than that, we are a very straightforward build. From there, there's the uh, Jol oh, sorry, the Zapdos Shrine base build. This was, you know, kind of popular, uh, popularized in Japan, but hasn't really teed off um, over, from what I can see on um, on all the chat sites and everything. Um, no one's really taken this super seriously. I think the tag teams coming out with so much tank ability has sort of taken the limelight away from this sort of Shrine base build. And I would foresee a lot more Jolteon than Shrine stuff. But the upswings of this deck is that you have a key Boswell turn and you have a key Nihiligo turn. So if you can look out for those rainbow energies, you can get some big tempo swings after just having steady pressure from Zapdos throughout the entire game. In at number five, Celebi Venusaur is going to be where I place it. Um, ninth place in the uh, community's eyes of 38 votes. This was... it's a, It's been a really interesting ride for Celebi Venusaur. When it first came out, I was a believer. Then I started trying my own build and I kind of went off the boil with the deck and it had a lot of stick for just bricking and being terrible. And then one fateful day, Tord Reklev made a Twitter post and it pretty much changed everyone's impressions of Celebi Venusaur because he um, added in the Jirachi build and added in some pretty nice uh, tech cards like the Wondrous Labyrinth, like the Cyrus Prism Star to help out against some key matchups. And it really makes this deck more consistent than it used to be and patches up the holes that it used to have so 
I think this is a very strong contender. It has some great auto wins in Persimian Coco. Um, it can also have a nice Jolteon Greninja and Quagnag. Having a very strong Buzz Shrine and being good against the Zapdos variants is also nice. The only thing you need to bear in mind is that they are likely to be packing the Coco GX and you have to not over attach in that matchup. Zorak variants, I believe, will be close. It's just our natural raw output isn't that great. And if they're playing enough Acer Rollers and um, enough Max Potions and Pal Pads and stuff, it can get awkward for you. I think the saving grace for Celebi Venusaur is that you now play four Guzma and you try and GX attack back in those Guzma. So even if they are using the Acer Roller, you can be knocking out multiple Zerua all the time. That's pretty much your win con against them sometimes, because otherwise they'll just outheal you. So you've got to make sure you are able to spam your Guzmas at the same time as your escape ropes and all that good stuff. For unfavorables, I think Pikachu Zekrom can ramp to key numbers on certain turns, which is very awkward for you. Again, they can have the Tapu Koko GX, so you can't protect yourself a whole amount about having like two Venusaurs ready to go all the time. I think Lost March ramps to reasonable numbers as well. It's a steady flow of 200 plus, and although you can, well, you know, in, in the sort of mid to late game at least, and that steady flow is going to be awkward, even though you have, you know, the Prism Star Stadium cards, which can help heal or deny some Lost March player damage at times. Um, they're just constantly just announcing attacks against you, and although you can GX attack, etc., that damage is all pointless. Well, it's taking a one prize, but the damage is all kind of like wasted and. I feel like they can just do enough pressure over enough amount of turns if they pop off early. And also they can let loose you, and that can be just a loss condition itself for Celebi Venusaur. You can die in like three turns if you just get let, uh, let loose into nothing. Uh, Malamar variants as well, I believe, unfavorable. Again, I'm always le leaning towards Ultra Necrozma. That's the one that seems to be most popular in the community, and I believe to be the strongest. So I think that's the concern, and that's because Ultra can ramp into, again, one hit KOs with enough commitment of Malamars, with enough commitment of energy, it can save itself to take big one-shots. It can also do some Sky Scorching Light plays on the um, Celebes and the Jirachis for some late-game prizes as well if it needs to. Here is my list. It is, I think, one card different from the list that Todd posted on Twitter. It's dropped a Shaman for a fourth Judge Whistle. I don't like starting Shaman. Your win rate is so much higher starting either Jirachi or Celebi Venusaur. I just want to play three, Jira uh, three Shaman instead and have an extra whistle. Why not? In at number four, we have Lost March. And the community agrees. This got almost 100 votes. People are really hyping up Lost March. The New Age build that has the Emolga and the Pokemon communication is really exciting for a lot of people. We're seeing it ramp into much higher numbers than previously. The Pokemon count in the list is physically high as well to help reach these tag teams. That's one of the ma main reasons people are looking at it, giving it a very nice Pikachu Zekrom, also having a slight favored Celebi Venusaur in my eyes, and having slight favored versus Zorak variants if you are able to pop off with your early turns. Zapdos variants is always gonna be close. Sometimes they can just get the first prize and stay ahead the entire game. Uh, Buzz Shrine, I believe is unfavorable because they have that option of going for the Rule of Evil Weavile attack and knocking out um, Marshadows and Emolgas that you have on your board. You'll always have like at least one of those on the board, in my opinion, in almost every matchup. It's very, very rare for you to not be able to play the game without benching those. Um, whilst at the same time, they could just go ahead if they are able to high roll some um, early game, like Beast Energies, Diancies and stuff, especially if you lead something like uh, the Hopip. They can just take the first prize and keep up the entire game because you play a bunch of items, you play two abilities on your board a lot of the time. Again, the Emolga and the Marshadow, and it means they can knock out with Weavile and Garb super easily, so they can just stay ahead the entire game, and even if they aren't ahead, they can try and use Rule of Evil to catch back up, as long as they stay relatively close to you in prizes. For very unfavorables, Lost March is, you know, very good against some stuff and very bad against others. You're pretty much auto-losing against all of these decks that are trying to do spread approaches. Persimian Coco and Jolteon Greninja, obviously, will be using weakness on top of everything else. Quagnag is just using an Articuno attacking for 70 every turn and moving into a Werelord for, you know, a complete board wipe. And uh, Malamar variants have Sky Scorching Light with the Ultra Necrozma. So these are all things that, Ultra, uh, that Lost March pretty much just can't get around. It has nothing inherently that it can do outside of playing something like Sky Pillar, which I've seen some people discuss. But my list is not playing that. I am too concerned about bricking with Lost March. And I think the win rate of this deck is purely based on how much it ramps its damage on stuff like turn two. So I'm trying to weave towards that as much as possible. 
The Forum Olga offering Nuzzly Gathering improves your uh, Pokecoms and your Lost Blender potential. That's why you're now seeing a fourth copy in the deck being core, in my opinion, because you need to have that damage scaling as much as possible. Uh, I personally play no Ultra Ball in the list. I know some people play Ultra Ball, some people play Mysterious Treasure as well, so play around with that. I like Great Ball just for, again, more early Insta playable cards, trying to get lots of Hoppips down on the board, which I'm happy with, and I also don't really like discarding too much in the deck anyway, so... Uh, we still have the couple copies of Stretcher to help out early knockouts on things like Hoppips and um, Natus to make sure we can ramp, especially against the likes of Zoroark players, because they will be trying to target Hoppip turn by turn to keep you out of that 200 plus barrier. So having these stretches is going to be pretty crucial for that matchup. And we're playing 8 Energy. You could think about weaving in Super Boost again, because there is things like Wondrous Labyrinth going into Celebi Venusaur decks. If you just want to have the pure net ball synergy, you can go for that route as well because other mill variants seem to be a little bit less popular now that we have the likes of Pikachu Zekrom and also Zapdos Jolteon that will at the very least be playing Zero Aura in my eyes. And both those decks having Zero Aura and so much energy ramp is just really bad for you. So uh, it feels like mill is a little bit less popular going into this tournament, which I'm happy with. It feels like Celebi Venusaur is more, more aggressive, but just kind of tanking rather than a mill variant. Um, but it means that we don't really need Super Boost unless you are, again, trying to keep out, keep your eye out for uh, the big tag team stuff. On to number three, I have Malamar Variants. Community agrees. 123 votes for the Ultra Necrozma build being the most popular and also a lot of votes for the Psychic Malamar Variants as well. I think the fact that it can prey on Lost March is a great plus for the deck. Uh, also very nice at being able to ramp damage against these tag teams. Both Celebi and Venusaur and Pikachu Zekrom can fall two Ultra Necrozma hits, which means they're getting big upgrades on you. Uh, Zapdos variants, I believe, is close. You have Sky Scorching Light to pull you back in the lead, as long as um, your Malamars aren't all sort of taken out early by Zapdos pressure. Um, Buzz Shrine, as well, I believe, is slightly favoured, because you have uh, the Giratina army that you can just send at them the whole time. You can build towards Sky Scorching Light on things like um, Weavals and Mag Cargos as well, or anything else that they're having to bench. Um, they oftentimes have to keep benching things like Trubbishes, so they naturally fall into this Ultra Necrozma trap uh, for a couple prizes late on after just giving them an army of Giratinas. Um, Zoroark variants, I believe, are pretty close. I think if you're playing Double Band and Beast Energy, it's definitely close for you, although they can be trying to grinch down Malamars here and there. You don't need much for Ultra Necrozma to reach them, which is pretty cool for you. Um, and I think for unfavorables, Pissimian Coco is slightly unfavored. You do have, like I mentioned earlier when I was talking about Pissimian itself, your plays really are using Giratina to kill your own stuff, to keep them out of counter energy and to keep them out of, you know, flying flipping for like 100 damage. You want them to be flying flipping for like 60 or something like that. And also you can even go for Lunala Prism Star, which I'm playing in my Ultra build at the very least. Um, to ramp energies instead of using Malamar, so you don't need to fill your board against them so much, which is really cool. Quagnag is slightly unfavored in my eyes because they can do the big whale and knock out all your Malamars, leaving you with basically just a Giratina on the board. Uh, so you either have to pre-prepare an Ultra Necrozma to deal with a Whale Lord to sort of negate that play from ever happening, um, or you need to, uh, you know, sort of stay ahead the entire time. But it's going to be really difficult for you to do that. And Sky Scorching Light probably isn't doing enough against them. Um, Jolteon Greninja also seems a little unfavored. I've found it so often that they can just deal with too many in case for you to get meaningful damage with your Ultra Necrozma. Um, and you don't really want to be using things like Giratina. Its numbers don't reach quite neatly enough against Jolteon. And they also have their GX attack on top of that, meaning that you need to have the right answers in the right turn. So... Lots of awkwardness going on for the Jolteon Greninja matchup, especially when you're working with less Malamars than you would normally like to see. Here is my list. First of all, for a DCE-based Malamar. This was actually one that didn't get many votes at all, um, but I do think it has merits. The main merits, really, is that if you play double Onyx, you're really trying to just see any Zoroark variant, and you're really looking to see any Pika Rom. I think that's a big selling point on itself, right? If you have... These eight Psych Energies and a couple DCEs, it will not be hard for you to just have Onyx coming out every turn. You also have Ultra Necrozma and Eevee Snorlax for backup attacking potential. Um, also offering you some nice late game draw engine with his Megaton Friends GX attack. Notably, I have cut Dawn Wings from the list um, because I'm just not seeing its value anymore. 180 isn't a great number like it used to be, especially because Blacephalon is falling out of favor. 
um, and it's weak to dark, and it's just an awful starter in any non-GX matchup. Obviously, you could say the same about Eevee Snorlax. It's a really bad lead in these non-GX matchups, but at the very least, you could be using Cheer Up for extra energy acceleration, and, and he actually serves a purpose rather than Dawn Wings, which seems to serve much less of a purpose these days. Because, like I said, that 180 critical number just isn't important as much anymore, other than maybe other mirror matches. But even then, it's pretty hard to come by. Uh, I think the other things to take note of is playing this mini adventure bag package with three boards. Boards are still pretty vulnerable if there are going to be lots of Absol in the format. Um, but I think it is still worth playing. It also lets you play one choice band, which is critical for using Giratina to knock out Tapu Lele's, which is really cool for you for getting up trades as well because you can Distortion Door, then Guzma with that choice band. It's pretty huge. And I think it gives you this nice little mini engine. The Viridian Forest and the Acro Bikes and the 10 Ball Search cards gives us plenty of options for getting lots of Mallies down and lots of Psychic Energies in the bin. So I'm really happy with this build. The one for me, though, is the Ultra Necrozma. I think it provides us the most options. Again, I've gone double Giratina. It is so important to have an army of non-GXs. And Giratina is one of the best at doing that because it can set up Sky Scorching Light for you so nicely whilst also being tanky at 130 hit points and being able to do that perfect number of 130 as well at the same time. Ultra Necrozma is able to benefit from Viridian Forest even more so than other Malamar-based builds because we're playing the split of energy cards, the 3 Metal and the 7 Psychic. Beast Energy and Double Band gives us a reasonable matchup against Zoroark for certain. I like playing the Lunala Prism Star. It's going to mean you're very strong in mirror match situations, and he's another tanky Pokemon against other non-GX builds whilst also giving us an option against Pissimi and Coco to attach our energy cards without having to commit Malamars to the build, uh, sorry, to the board. So I think this build is one of the decks that I've been testing most, to be honest. I think if I was to be playing this event, I think this is probably the deck for me. I really like this 60, and I think the deck is very, very solid going into this tournament. On to number two, we have Pikachu and Zekrom. It was the most voted deck from the community with 174. It was close, but... This was the most popular for people. For me, Pikachu Zekrom is a phenomenal combo deck. It is able to reach silly numbers and accelerate a silly amount of energy cards when you are able to get these combos off. It can also try and use things like Let Loose to hurt other people at the same time as presenting this massive threat that has to be knocked out on the turn that he basically comes into play. Otherwise, he will snowball so heavily that the game will be over in three or four turns. That is honestly how the Pikachu Zekrom tries to do its business. It will be trying to combo on turns one and two, and then it will try to be ending the game on turns four and five if it's been slow, basically, which is very scary to think about. For favorables, I think Celebi Venusaur, like I say, if you try and uh, maintain some key pieces, like holding on to choice bands and electro powers for key turns, you can get them in good situations. And you have Zero Aura to move around their status conditions, which is very nice. Jolteon Greninja, I think, just doesn't have enough damage potential to deal with a Pikachu Zekrom, allowing you to, you know, get one on the field, get another one on the field, and then get so much energy on the board that you can move into your GX attack, which is going to be very valuable for you. Uh, Zorark variants, I believe, is close. I've had a lot of debates with people about how this matchup goes. I think most Zorark, Zorark Lycanroc decks are playing things like uh, Counter Gain. They're playing sometimes five energy cards. Um, they're playing a thick Lycanroc line. They're playing a Lily build to try and draw cards early to have that combination ready for a Pikachu Zekrom if they do start popping off early. I've seen how Pikachu Zekrom players can try to just go pure for Zero Aura and even ignore Pikachu Zekrom sometimes and have enough energy acceleration just attacking with Zero Aura being efficient enough with choice bands and electro powers if it needs to. So there are different ways that Zoro players will, and Pikachu Zekrom players will try and navigate this matchup. Uh, but overall, I do think it is just very close. It's based on how quickly Pikachu Zekrom pops off and if Zorok has an answer. And then if they do have the answer, how does Pikachu Zekrom respond? Do they have any fuel left to get the response knockout and carry on to dominate the board? Or will a Lycanroc stick and then the Zorok player is heavily, heavily ahead in the game? For unfavorables, I think Malamar variants are still a little bit awkward, especially Ultra, because uh, you are always intimidated about putting down your Pika Rom, and the Giratina is efficient enough at dealing with the likes of your Coco GX and your Zero Auras, especially with enough Distortion Doors. Zapdos variants, I believe, are a little bit awkward as well, because they can just be non-GX throughout the entire game, and two-shotting seems to be reasonable enough, especially because Pika Roms are going away from healing 
and more towards combo based. You can improve your Zapdos matchup if you want to have the heals in there though. Quagnag, I believe, is slightly unfavored. Again, the Onyx coming down is going to be a big pain for you. They can be all non-GX and you can't interact with their energy cards. And I think also for the very unfavorables, Lost March, Basimian, and Bud Shrine. At the end of the day, Pikachu Zekrom is the new hotness that everyone is trying to uh, play and everyone's trying to beat at the same time. That's why you can see so many unfavorables for this deck. It's because it's on everyone's radar. It's the number one ranked pick in the community and everyone does well no one wants to lose to this deck going into the tournament i do think it's just very aggressive and powerful but i do think it's going to be on everyone's radar to try and beat it so if you are going to do well with this deck you have to know it inside and out you need to know its matchups and you need to um be able to have a very consistent list to make things happen for you trying to make a consistent list here with my picaron build I've seen some people cutting Raikou. I've seen some people going up to three Pika Roms. You can try and go for that if you really wish. Um, you can try and go more non-GX focused if you want as well. There's the option to have healing cards, but it feels like most people are moving towards just trying to get combo as much as possible. Let Loose is a really nice addition to the deck. Um, trying to get yourself into a nice board state whilst also Let Loosing. Trying to make people like Zoroark players not have an instant response to you. It's going to be amazing for your win rate. I really like personally playing EXP Share. It opens the door for these early Zapdos pressure knockouts, early Raikou knockouts, and you're not losing energy at the same time. It really just opens the door for your prize trade to be efficient, and then just a Pikachu Zekron can come down later in the game. It means you're a little bit less combo-based, but that's absolutely fine in my book sometimes. So I'm a big fan of the EXP Share. If you're not a fan of it, you can just go to a fourth Acro Bike or an extra supporter card if you want to, or even something like a Mysterious Treasure, which works really nicely in the deck for... Having extra, uh, extra Lele outs and a means of getting Marshadow quite cheaply as well, which is pretty uh, pretty cool for you as well. So I do think the deck is strong and it's definitely going to be popular at the IC. On to my number one pick, Zoroark Variants, the one that takes all the wins at all the internationals. Uh, I'm surprised this wasn't voted the top pick. I mean, just based on its track record at ICs and the fact that you'll know that there will be a lot of Zoroark in the room. You've got to place it high. It was, it was given 130 votes for a pure Zora Rock and 30 more votes on top of that for Zora Rock Weavile. So just falling a little short of the hype of Pikachu Zekrom coming out. But overall, I think we know everything about Zora right now. It's going to keep everyone honest. Any missed turn of tempo, Zora will capitalize on and win. And that's why its matchup spread doesn't look too impressive. But it's close against enough decks in the format where it can just be piloted correctly out consistency people and just have more optimal turns than every other deck because it can draw so many cards and that's where it win that's where its win rate really comes from it's just the fact that other players can have slower starts more often or they can just be get punished by a big combination turn that you've been able to accumulate with the Zoroark and that's really where you get your wins with Zoro I do think it's still super consistent I love the fact that you have Pokecom now the deck is just even better at getting your turn one supporter of choice and getting more Zoroarks into play turn two. And that just helps the win rate of any matchup, basically, because your board is just able to draw so much more for your deck, and ha you have the options to react to whatever your opponent does. For favorables, I think Quagnag is a small one to pick up, because I really think the Lycanroc and the uh, Muck are both ways to get around the Articuno, so you can just be dealing with their engine and hurt their energy attachments in the first place. Obviously, the biggest fear is them attacking with Onyx. That's the only real thing they can do against you for trying to win back a prize race. Zapdos variants, Malamar variants, Celebi Venusaur, Jolteon Greninja, and Pika Rom. I believe they're winnable. I believe they're losable based on, you know, if Malamar is able to hit the choice bands at the right times, if Zapdos is able to gust enough early to uh, limit your draw, or if you just miss an Ace of Roll on a certain turn, stuff like that. If they're able to deal with a Grimer and a Ditto, or if one of those two pieces are prized, or if you're not able to nest ball enough out early, these are all loss conditions for your Zoroark player, but they have easy ways to win as well. For unfavorables, I think Pasimian Coco and Loss March slightly fall into that category, and Bush Shrine is the big one that you never want to see, in my opinion, just because they have so many threats that can deal with pretty much your entire board, especially because we're much more... Uh, honed in on just a Lycanroc Weavile build. We have very few answers to Bud Shrine right now. So here is my Zora Rock Weavile build. I think the Alolan Grimer is the include that is pretty staple now because Alolan Muck becomes so much more important with Jirachi builds floating all over the place. 
Uh, some Malamar decks are playing it. Some um, Zapdos decks are playing it. Uh, Celebi Venusaur is even playing it. You know, there's going to be so much Jirachi that we need to shut this down. And the Aloha Muck is going to be a great card to do that. I think the Pokey Pokemon communication is just so huge for the deck. It's absolutely nuts. It just helps the consistency skyrocket. And that's what this deck absolutely loves. It opens the door for you to play a Lily build because you can thin your hand earlier for more basics without the worry that we previously had of just missing Nest Balls off Lily. We have so many more outs to get basics down that we can get the full benefit of drawing into excess energy cards to get early attachments in the game, to get our Lycanroc rolling early, and just means that we have enough cards in our hand to respond to what our opponent does much more of the time. So I think Zora Rock, Lycanroc is still going to be really popular, powerful, and I wouldn't be surprised if it made top 8 or higher, to be honest, because Zora Rock always does well at ICs, just because when there are tournaments with that, where, that many rounds, you just want a deck to be consistent and powerful, and that's what this is at the end of the day. Much less popular, but still I thought was worth noting, was Zoro Desi Tales. This was one of the top contenders uh, in the Sun and Moon to Lost Thunder format. It fell off towards the end of the meta when Zoro Rock started becoming more popular, but I do think it's worth revisiting. The Lavatars that include that I've gone for here, the Second Strike Lavatar, uh, over Yveltal GX because he's too much of a liability in other lightning-based matchups when you see Jolteons, etc., um, but Lavatar is going to be trying to uptrade on other Zoroark players and against Picarom. And uh, the Pokemon communication can also be used to the fullest extent in this deck. When we're playing 22 Pokemon in total, it can give us better odds for early Leles for Elms, which I'm still playing Elm in this build uh, because you don't have the space for the Ninetales and the Nest Balls, to be honest. Um, but just the biggest headache of this deck was previously timeable and we're just playing one now because you can get it off nine tails anyway but it was basically live or die by the flips previously and now having pokecom is a great safety net for the deck you'll notice i'm playing viridian forest and i've gone to all basic energy cards outside of the dces that's because mainly uh, we don't want to have 190 hit points on our fairy tails because it's so much easier for the lightning decks to take one shots on it because their multipliers are on 30s both the uh sorry they're on um odd numbers so Effectively, you force an extra choice band or an extra electro power in order to uh, take one shot. So I think it's really, really bad for you to be playing Rainbow Energies in this deck now. You want to play basics. And I previously had a field blower. Now Viridian comes in to help this basic energy count whilst also being a way of removing some uh, Prism Star Stadium cards, which field blower can't do anymore. So I do like the include of Viridian and cutting away from rainbows because it's so bad against the lightning decks overall. So that leaves the decks that are outside the top 10. Which decks are you rooting for that are not that did not quite make my list? Blacephalon was still very popular in the rankings uh, when I looked at the community review. Very surprising to me, seeing as I think its power spike turn is on turns like three or four when B-Strings activate, and Picarom is having a power spike turn on turn one or two. It means that you just become the worst aggro deck, which is very concerning. You also have very awkward loss march and um, Zapdos matchups, so I think Blacephalon is going to be falling from grace a little bit. God of War Ninetales has seen a little bit of hype, getting Pokemon communications very cool for the deck, as well as a few other fairy toys that you can work into the list. Um, and there's even the Nidoqueen Meganium Swampert type build that I've been uh, sort of thinking about and mulling over. Still trying to work out a perfect list for that deck, so I haven't um, recorded it yet, but... I think, again, playing an evolution deck is scary when there's Lost March just trying to let loose you all the time. Picarom as well can be let loosing, and they just have Zapdos as well being early aggression against not uh, your early basics, so I think that's always awkward. Turbo Ray was very close to being in my top 10 list. I ended up going over with Quagnag, uh, Quagnag just because of its matchup spread, but uh, Rayquaza is able to go way more turbo now with the Coco Prism Star, you're able to supplement those energies with charging up. You're able to play Shaman as well as an extra non-GX attacker in the list. I think in a vacuum it's very strong. I just think it's not quite as strong as something like Picarom, so I would rather just be going down that route. Buzzrock can keep the Zoroark players and the uh, Picaroms in check, but really does not like to see any of the Zapdos base builds, so that's always going to be scary for you. And it feels like it's less consistent than some of the aggro options that we have out there in the format. Meganium Swampert nonsense is always worth considering. There's the Greninja GX build, there's Mill builds, there's uh, Nidoqueen builds, there's all sorts to try and work around this engine. 
the options just get wider and wider. There's Decidueye Porygon builds as well if you really want to. So there's going to be some random stage two that can be fit into the deck and get one hit KOs somewhere in certain situations. So uh, it's something that you can look into for sure. Uh, there's limitation lock builds, which I'm definitely keeping an eye out for. Black Market Prism Star is a scary combination with that deck. Raichu and the Snuggly Generator deck also was able to gain a Mulga. And at the same time, um, it has the Coco Prism Star. So it's powerful spark attack ramps way more than previously. And there's also the Tool Drop deck, which you could be considering as another non-GX threat. Most notably, Metal Goggles can go into this list to improve your matchup against Ultra Necrozma. That's a common flaw that a lot of the other non-GX decks have in the format right now. It's that they can all fall to Ultra Squids. But if you have Metal Goggles, you can have a much better matchup against the Mali stuff. So that might be overall pretty appealing to you. So that's it for my top 10, guys. There were a couple wacky picks toward the beginning, but I do hope that you um, see what I mean in terms of the matchup spread. And maybe I've inspired you to try and test out one of these wackier lists. Um, but I do believe the top decks, you know, the pretty much top five or six are definitely core cool for me. I think they're going to be the key contenders in the format. If you want to win at the uh, IC, I would suggest Ultra Necrozma. I think it's a very, very strong deck that is versatile and doesn't have too many very bad matchups. And if you want to go and have some fun and style on people, Jolchon Greninja is a great deck to have in your hands. And you can really punish some Lost March players and some other non-GX builds at the same time. And you can pretty much just out-aggress a lot of things in the format right now, just because you're able to target down your damage and make the most of it so efficiently. I think it's a really cool deck and a great throwback to a deck that previously was really awesome in the format. So maybe it, history might repeat itself and Jolteon Greninja may become a real presence in the game. Let me know what you guys think of the list. I hope you did enjoy the community addition to the, build, to the, uh, to the video as well. So... Yeah, that's going to be all from me, guys. See you in Melbourne if you are attending. And uh, yeah, cheers.